Not only that, Alex's uncle is also logging on this evening to watch his nephew. So we've got a lovely family connection as well tonight. So I think it's best now if I introduce Joe Lock MW, our buyer for South Africa. So good evening, Joe, and cheers. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be here. And for me, I have to say, for the second of these Wine Champions tastings this week and events this week, um, a huge pleasure that that includes South Africa uh, and particularly Chenin Blanc, uh, which was the particular winning wine uh, uh, this year. Um, we've been working with Bradford Dale, with Alex, for we reckon about 15 years when we talked about it. I went there when I went out to South Africa in 2004 when I first joined the Wine Society as a buyer. And actually, it was a Cape Wine year. And I seem to remember you guys throw a very good party. I was still young enough to go to the after show parties in those days. And it was it was a cracking it was a cracking one. But they make seriously good wine. Um, Alex is going to take you through a, a, a potted history, if you like, um, from their first bottling in 1998 and actually prior um, how, how Alex got involved in the wine industry himself. Um, but Radford Dell is now one of the most consistent and one of the most dynamic in the Cape. And that's actually not an easy thing to achieve, to be able to do both those things well. So I'm absolutely uh, delighted to welcome Alex um, and for him to take us through his perspective of the modern South Africa from his roots in Europe um, and his home now in the Cape. So Alex, over to you, welcome. Thank you, Joe. very kind of you. Good to see you. Uh, can you uh, hear me okay? Cheers to everybody. Um, I'll, I'll start by a special cheers to my Uncle Charlie, who's a member of the Wine Society, who's hopefully tuned in. Obviously, I'm drinking Chenin Blanc, rude not to. So um, I'm going to um, start by, I guess, loading onto the screen, if this works, the presentation that I want to share with everybody this evening. How's that looking, Joe? Can you see that? Yep. Look yep. Okay, great. You can just give me a thumbs up. Looks like South Africa. That is, that's a picture taken of actually one of our Shannon vineyards on the property. Um, and that's the Helderberg Mountain in the background. We'll go into that in a minute. Um, what I what I was asked to do is to give you a little bit of a background on, on uh, myself as well as um, as well as Raphael, so I'm just trying to, oopsie, going too quickly. I'm just trying to get a picture that's found its way onto my screen there, it's gone. So, um, Radford Dale, uh, best of both worlds, indicating that Ben and I are from different parts of the planet. He's from the Southern Hemisphere, I'm from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, I'll explain in a little while how we got together, but our, our approach has always been to uh, produce wines that, that bring what really sets South Africa apart, and that is the, the warmth of the uh, wonderful summers that we have in the Southern Hemisphere and in, in, in Stellenbosch in South Africa. But we have the geology and we have the, the, the conditions that allow us to make wines with restraint, which are more European in style than, most people, than many people would expect. So the best of both worlds is how we characterize it. Um, so let's, let's start by me explaining a little bit my background, which is um, not something which I would normally do. This is the first time I've ever done this, um, explaining uh, my own career and mine, but here we go. So, um, two castles linked my childhood. Uh, I think most people recognize the one on the left, that's Windsor Castle. And um, that was very close to where I was born and where I grew up. And you could see it from my the sports grounds of my school in Farnham Common. And, um, and I used to spend my, my childhood days, uh, well, summer and Easter often holidays, in Burgundy, um, where my family had an interest in a property there. And we used to stay very regularly at the Chateau de Samuel Les Bonnes, um, which was the most incredible place for a, a five to 10 year old child to uh, have adventures uh, and uh, get accustomed to Burgundy living and uh, very impactful on my, on my youth. So that as soon as I was allowed to leave school, the first thing I did was to make a beeline for Burgundy. It was always in my, um, 
desire to to live in that part of the world. So there's a picture of me in the middle there in the courtyard of the chateau, the fashion guru that I was. Luckily, that was very short lived. Um, and then um, moving to Burgundy. So in 1983, my father and, and some of his friends had this wacky idea of opening up an English pub in, in the middle of Bone. So Bone being the, the, the cultural capital of Burgundy, as I'm sure you know. And uh, they literally reconstructed a genuine English pub, an old sort of hunting lodge type vibe in the middle of Bone next to Notre Dame, uh, bringing everything with it, including the bricks from the foundry that they reopened in, um, near, near, uh, in Berkshire, somewhere I can't remember where. Um, everything was authentic. And um, I, after a short while, um, began to work there. Uh, I was actually studying in Dijon. I did three years uh, at Dijon University and then worked at Pickwick's and took it over um, very shortly thereafter. And it became a very successful location, um, very well supported by the locals. And um, in 1990, I opened a, a wine bar in the 11th century vaulted cellar of the building, as you can see there. Yes, I had hair. Um, amazingly, that's a lot of people that know me don't remember that. Um, and it was ever, it was actually the first ever non-smoking bar in France in nine, June 1990, which may not sound very revolutionary today, but I can assure you, uh, France is very definitely a nation of heavy smokers, and especially in those days. So, depriving people of the right to smoke was not appreciated by many people. So uh, we had some animated experiences, but the the local custom was what. I was really targeting not tourism at all. And one of these pictures I, I, I put here in the middle is, um, uh, you can see our type of customer that we had. We've got Veronique Durand there and her husband, Michel Boss, actually met at that dinner in my in my bar. Uh, there's a, one of the Bouchard next to them. Next to them is Benoit Goujon, who used to work for Laurent Perrier. Behind them, you've got uh, Bouzereau from Mercer. You've got another Durand on the right. So th it really was a clientele of local producers and a wonderful environment, um, wonderful um, ambiance and bringing um, British contact to the Burgundian industry. And it was a fantastic place for people to meet after tastings and for a long day in the vineyards or whatever. It was, really was the local. And it was thanks to that I met so many people I've had friendships with forever since then. Um, we, uh, one of our claims to fame was that we made it into the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, in fact, we were in it numerous times um it was a bit of luck really because uh, we used to auction the first glass of Beaujolais Nouveau every year um and um we managed to reach some extortionate prices <laughs> i actually had the idea of getting the the crieur the, the auctioneer from the Vente des Vins, the famous burgundy bone Vente des Vins. paul berbe was his name he did us the honor of coming each year to auction the first glass from the barrel of Beaujolais that we had on the bar and we had TV from different parts of the world that would stream it live. And um, we got into the Guinness Book of Records repeatedly. So that was um, amazing. So the most expensive bottle of wine in the world was, if I remember correctly, used to be was Chateau La Tour or Chateau Marga, I can't remember, one of the two. And then the most expensive glass of wine in the world was Beaujolais Nouveau, which was hilarious. There you go. Who dares wins? <laughs> um, 1988, I started working for one of the old uh, but small, high-quality negotiant firms in Burgundy, which was called Maison Jafflin, which was about a, a bottle throw from Pickwick's, literally. And it was run by the very dynamic, rebellious, uh, then young uh, man, Bernard Ruppolt, who you can see on the left-hand side there, my first boss. And he and I are at the Kensington Wine Fair in 1988 on my Uncle Robert's stand, because I'm fourth generation in the wine industry, strictly speaking. And he was our importer, my uncle. And uh, there's the courtyard of Jaffrin, which had these incredible 11th century cellars, Gothic cellars called the Chapitre, because it's right next to Notre Dame. So it was the chapter of, um, of the Basilique and it used to be run by the monks. And it was a very sociable place, as you can see from that tasting in a barrel. Um, we used to get up to all sorts of um, fun and games. And there in the far right hand side was a barrel tasting with a, if I remember correctly, it was a Swedish customer and a very skinny, hirsute young myself standing next to Bernard Ruppel, who's wearing the same clothes I've noticed. Yes, he didn't have too many changes of clothing, if I remember correctly. Um, you know what they say about the French. 
Um, I may as well. Where, where, where do the French hide their savings? Under the soap. There we go. Little joke to start with. Um, 1990 was a big year for me. It was my um, first vintage at Domaine Jacques Prieur in, in Meursault. And uh, Martin Prieur, you can see with me in the second picture, one of my oldest and closest friends to this day. And uh, there we are doing pigeage in a cuve of Volney Claude et Centeneau, which is not the same as Claude, is not the same as Centeneau, but Claude et Centeneau, which is a monopole, uh, very prestigious. And he and I um, had an absolute ball in 1990. It was an amazing vintage. It was a big vintage, and normally you don't get big and high quality, but it was an exceptional vintage on every level. And it was the vintage that Martin took over the estate from his father, a generational change, which in that era was very impactful in Burgundy. Martin was very focused on viticulture and wine quality. His father was not. Um, his father used to sell all his wines through a trader in Bordeaux, negotiate a house from Bordeaux. It wasn't even in Burgundy. And Martin took it upon himself to turn the domain around. It's, today, it's one of the most famous domains in Burgundy. Incredible land owning.s My favorite red wine of all times is Le Musigny, and there's a picture of me standing in front of Le Musigny. And um, I've been proud to be there in Porter in South Africa for, goodness me, 25 years now. Uh, so a very close personal relationship um, for a very long time. I met Martin in Pickwick's initially, by the way. Then 1994, the big move. I, I, prior to this, I'd done six vintages in South Africa whilst I was living in Burgundy because of the opposite um, seasons. Summer in South Africa is the middle of winter in Burgundy. And it, you know, my first winter in Burgundy, um, 83, 84, got down to minus 24, which was extraordinarily cold. So um, I was very happy to spend summers, sorry, winters in South Africa and came down six years in a row as I was invited by friends who own Hartenberg Estate and still do. And um, in 1994, on the 27th of April, um, Nelson Mandela was elected president. Three days later, they'd finished the count. Uh, the result, which nobody doubted, was announced and I handed in my resignation in Burgundy um, and set out to move to South Africa, which I did four months later, arriving um, at the beginning of spring 1994 in South Africa. Um, I teamed up with some friends and uh, some new people that I met, but other people that I'd been friends with. And we created a, one of the first new wineries in South Africa post-apartheid, when all the sanctions had been dropped and the industry was booming. Uh, we created a winery called Longridge, and, and we opened that in January 1995. So I was one of the founding partners. And um, this business, um, because we had the, the timing to open when sanctions had dropped and boom, market conditions existed, um, this business went from zero to a million cases, a million nine liter cases in four and a half years. So it was an incredible growth. Uh, not, not, the most, not the most amazing experience in that regard because it was almost out of control. And it was a size that I didn't enjoy. So I wanted to do things which were very much focused on quality and on individuality, authenticity. And due to that, um, I decided to start looking at another project, which I'll come to in a second. But here you have Longridge on the Helderberg Mountain in Stellenbosch. This is, if you were, the second photo is myself in front of the, of the winery. Um, looking at the camera, I'd be actually looking at the ocean. So. This mountain overlooks the ocean, so it's genuinely influenced by the cool maritime breezes. It's south facing. For me, it's the finest spot in Stellenbosch. And in fact, um, Radford Dale today is based exa almost exactly where I'm standing in that picture, just on the other side of the road behind me. Well, sorry, in front of me. <laughs> uh, so Radford Dale is neighbors to Longridge today. So we, we look at the same mountain and the ocean. And here we have some pictures, our first. Uh, the next one along is Ben and myself and our UK importers of the day, uh, who remain very good friends. And then I thought the nice uh, picture of Ben and myself and friends at uh, our favorite restaurant, 96 Winery Road in Stellenbosch, which is a legendary wine industry restaurant. And there on the table, you may see a bottle of Domaine Jacques Prieur and a bottle of Longridge, which was really the transition for me from Burgundy to South Africa. So, what came next? It was Radford Dale and, and Radford Dale started in 1998. Um, and that's um, an idea that I had with Ben and Ben originally is from Australia. Um, today he lives back in Australia. And Ben and I met originally in Burgundy 
and then coincidentally came down to South Africa doing vintages at the same time. And then lo and behold, we both immigrated almost to the day, coincidentally at the same time. So our, our, our destinies became intertwined. He started working for another winery um, called Slaley in Stellenbosch. And after a few years, as I was developing Raffadel very significantly, uh, sorry, uh, Longridge, um, I said to Ben, come on board. So Ben joined us at Longridge and became head of winemaking. And um, he and I decided that we were going to start this project in 1998 called Radfordale, where we were going to work purely with single vineyard, high quality vineyards, which had a massive quality potential that hadn't necessarily been identified previously. And we would make small lots of these very balanced wines um, from single vineyards. And that's how it all started. And that kicked off in, in 1998. Ben subsequently left South Africa uh, about five or six years later. I bought him out. And I brought in some other partners subsequently. And, um, but we are, we've remained very good friends and I go and see him every year in Australia. In fact, import his wines into South Africa. So a little map of the winelands. Um, I, I always joke that, that the, the, the little map inside the map. So Africa, I put that there for our, when I go to America because often they don't know where South Africa is. So that that's, uh, helps and the name should give it away. Um, and you can see the RD logos on different vineyard areas. Um, so these are the six vineyard areas that we have focused on, that we have developed our wines from, because our wines are all vineyard driven. Rather than owning a, a building or a winery and having vineyards all the way around it and only making wine from that site, which doesn't appeal to me at all, um, I, I very much, if you like, with the Burgundian mindset that the most interesting, the most important factor is the geology and the, um, the terroir. So the combination of the geology, the location, the aspect and the climate um, and the impact that that has on the vines. And so um, I have sought out locations which have the potential to make incredible individualistic wines with different varieties and different styles. And consequently, there's no way you could do that in one site. Um, so we, you'll see there's a cluster in the south, there's a cluster of three areas um, which we'll go into a little bit um, those are all genuinely cool climate areas uh, Elgin up in the mountains uh, where it never goes above 25 degrees centigrade in Hermanus uh, it's further south beautiful area uh, for making cooler varietal wines and then further south again um, an area which is called um, Stanford which is part of you know the, the Walker Bay area but it's uh, it's actually a, a new emerging region where it's even further south and cooler again. So we're, we're making genuinely cool climate wines, which perhaps people don't expect exist in South Africa. And we've been doing it for a very long time. So I won't say we've pioneered it, but we've certainly been among people doing it the longest consistently. And then above that, if you go further north, up into what is famous today, the Swartland. But when we started working there in the early 2000s, um, there were only three people making premium wines and bottling them. Uh, the rest was all made into bulk wines and um, exported and, and what have you and, and blended away. And so we were, we were really one of the early adopters of the, of the region and introduced by my very good friend Ibn Saadi, who's a legend these days. Um, so we make a pretty famous, in the South African context, red blend from there, which is called Black Rock. And we work with some beautiful organic vineyards, making wines with zero additions, including zero sulfur in the four Paderberg, which is on the other side of the Paderberg mountain from the Swartland. Uh, in this area, it gets up to 50 degrees centigrade. So it's pretty hot. Um, but because of the geology or thanks to the geology, um, we're still able to make wines which have got poise and balance and even refreshing characteristics, would you believe it? And then last but not least is our base, which is Stellenbosch in that green section. And we're right on the coastal side overlooking the ocean and the south. So we have genuine, genuine cool climate influences, although it does remain warmer there. Um, I love this side of Stellenbosch. Um, the soils are very granite based as they are in most of the Cape. And we're able to make these incredibly fresh wines with beautiful sunshine. So again, underlining what makes our, uh, the, the, if you like the philosophy of Radfordale and this old world tradition, new world energy, is that we, we, we're most interested in the land and the, and the potential of the site. In Burgundy, um, it can say Grand Cru on the label, but it doesn't mean to say that the wine in the bottle is any good. It just tells you that the location has high potential. And that's what we've set out to discover in one generation 
these these vineyards which weren't known under isolation and the first um, the first generation post apartheid it's been our role to discover these and uncover them so geology and climate is, is what drives us individuality of the wines is, is really important we don't make wines by numbers um, we're, we're not interested in predictable wines we're not commercial winemakers we don't sell to supermarkets um, we want to make site specific wines and genuinely with as little intervention as possible so that the wines speak of their origin, speak of their vineyard, speak of their site and speak of their vintage. For me, all those are qualities that I hold dear in wine and that I was, um, I, I was gonna say brainwashed, but were inbred to me from uh, all my years in Burgundy and since I was a child, uh, they're super important. And the new world uh, has, has had a tendency perhaps to, to lose sight of those things, but for us, it's the driving factor. And these are some pictures of some of the vineyards that we work with to give you an idea of the topography and the beauty of the land. First one is the Helderberg, um, which is incredible um, dramatic mountain which juts out of the earth and cascades down into the, uh, into the ocean. Um, the ocean there is still very cold because it's, um, you have the Agalas current, which brings the cold water from the icebergs, if you like, melted icebergs past the southern coast and the west coast of South Africa. So the water is actually very cold. And we have these beautiful sea breezes. As you can see, there's granite everywhere. All the mountains are granite. So a lot of the soils are granite based, which again, gives us these more refreshing wines. Um, Elgin is up in, the, up in the mountains, literally. It's from 700 meters to 1,000 to meters above sea level. Whereas in the Helderberg on the, on the slopes, there are probably 200 meters, 150 meters. And Elgin is genuinely cool, uh, more cloud cover, higher rainfall, much later ripening, so we get much more delicate wines. And we, we focus on Pinot Noir there. And Himlanada, which is next to Hermanus, I'm sure many of you have been to the seaside town of Hermanus. Absolutely picturesque, one of the most beautiful little valleys in the, in the country. And here we specialize again in Pinot Noir. Um, I, I ran out of the, the land of hope, Shinnan, so I brought the Pinot Noir to drink tonight, uh, which is from this valley. And then the Swartland, um, as you can probably guess from this picture, much hotter, as I said, up to 50 degrees centigrade. A lot of granite soils, but also some clay and some sand as well, which give us some variation depending on the varieties. For Paderberg, we only work with organic vineyards. And uh, we specialize in Syrah. And this is, again, a vineyard that we, we produce wine with zero additives, including no added sulfur whatsoever. And then Walker Bay, uh, as I mentioned, right down in the south, much, much cooler. Uh, it's quite windy there, so we have to manage the canopies, the vineyards differently. Um, high acidity wines, low yielding again because of the wind, but very pretty, very precise wines. And um, uh, th that particular area has a great future, I think, Stanford. It doesn't have its own Appalachian yet because it's still too young a vineyard. These vines are uh, about 15 years old. Um, but I think with time, it will, it will gain recognition for sure. So there you go, there's an, uh, an idea of places where we work. Um, and then 2003 came along. Um, and 2003 was significant for us because A, it was a lovely vintage. It was a very cool vintage. Uh, we made wines of great balance and poise in South Africa. Um, it was one of those vintages I just really enjoyed, which was the opposite of Europe, because you may recall in 2003, it was this big heat wave, in, particularly in France. Um, but um, what is the Winery of Good Hope? Well, the Winery of Good Hope is a range of wines that we make um, which we initiated in 2003 um, because friends of ours in the industry um, and customers in the industry who had been following Radford Dale um, for, since our inception said to us, please, can you make us um, some wines with the same philosophy of Radford Dale, but at a more affordable level that we can, A, drink more regularly on a sort of a daily basis and which we can sell to restaurants so that we can have South African high quality South African wines by the glass in restaurants to get people to believe in South African wines. Most South African wines in, 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 at that time were sold in supermarkets, almost none were sold in restaurants. And it was generally you know, bigger brands that were available and not a lot of small producers like ourselves. So we took it upon ourselves to, to find a way to um, take exactly the same approach to Radf as we do with Radfordale and to adapt that into wines which are made for earlier drinking, which are, for example, they can be from exactly the same vineyards, but it can be from a younger block. They can be from grapes which are not fermented in barrel, for example. Um, the bottles we use tend to be lighter. And we don't age the wines as long. 
perhaps they don't have barrel maturation. Some do. Uh, so the, the un oak Chardonnay is a fantastic example. We make it in stainless steel tank. As the name suggests, un oak, there's no barrel fermentation, there's no barrel maturation. So there's a huge amount of cost which is saved. Um, but we don't skimp on the grapes. So the grape, the sources of the grapes are often adjacent to our Raffidel blocks. Sometimes the yields are a little bit higher, sometimes the vines are younger, but the sources of the grapes are high quality sources. So what it means is that when we make these wines, which are still small batch wines, uh, which are made by us 100% in the same building in small quantities, these are not big production runs. Um, these are wines which we're proud of. And in fact, um, during lockdown, these were the wines that I ran out of the quickest because uh, that's why I often have my fridge stack full of them. Um, and the Good Hope Shinnan, which actually the wine society has at the moment, was the one that uh, I drank the most of during lockdown. <laughs> so um, Wine Society uh, has worked for a very long time with the Un Oak Chardonnay, which you, you have in stock currently and repeatedly order. Uh, the Shinnan is in stock currently. And then from time to time, uh, Joe selects parcels of the Pinotage or the Syrah. Um, but I think it's the whites, in particular this time of the year, which are, which are fantastic to, uh, uh, to, to have access to. Um, so for us, it was about building trust in South Africa, getting more people um, to, to drink South African wines daily and to have wines which um, are really made with a, with a quality perspective and not made in huge volume for supermarkets. And um, they're incredibly good value for money. Then in 2004, um, lo and behold, we started working with the Wine Society, which has coincided with Joe coming down to the Cape, as she said. Uh, we had Cape Wine. Um, and yes, we do throw very good parties out after Cape Wine. It's, I always find that the, the best business is done outside of the show. And that's when relationships can really flourish and um, who cares about standing behind a counter pouring samples to people. Um, and the pinnacle of our success with the Wine Society has been to date, and I'm sure there'll be others. In 2015, we had the great honor of uh, composing the entire list of the fine wines from South Africa in your Christmas catalog. So Joe wrote me a, a lovely note and sent me the catalog in the post, snail mail. And uh, here it is. I think Joe didn't even know I did this. Um, I was so chuffed that we, we had it framed and it's prize of place on the wall in our tasting room. We have a very small tasting room. Uh, we're, we're a small winery and um, uh, this is there. So any of you come to visit, you will see it on our tasting room wall. So we've been working the, with the Wine Society for 16 years, um, one of our most valued customers, and uh, I'm delighted for that relationship. Thank you for supporting us, Joe, and to your, your members, obviously. Without them, it wouldn't work. Then, continuing the timeline. So 2007, um, Joe, you said something earlier that we're dynamic and we're, you know, consistently, it's, you know, when you make up a winery in your own, in your own head and you, you, you conceive these wines out of vineyards, which people didn't know about or you know, didn't care for. You know, when you look at them in hindsight, it sort of, a, it sort of makes a sense, it's logical. But when you're creating things and you're doing things as you go, um, it isn't so logical. And, and you, have to, you have to continuously question yourself and question what you're doing. But one of the things that I noted from being a foreigner living in South Africa and being so welcomed and, 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 and had such enjoyment working with my team, and by the way, that team is still in place today, um, was that the, uh, the people of color in South Africa, as everybody knows, um, had a very disadvantaged past um, for political reasons. And that the reason that I moved to South Africa was Nelson Mandela. Um, and so I thought, you know, after a number of years of having my own winery, that having this incredible team that not only just should they have um, great opportunities in their work and career paths and be paid you know, much better than the industry norm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it occurred to me that their loyalty was, was, was incredible um, and that we could do more. And so I set up a, a trust, a Land of Hope Educational Trust as its official name, whereby um, we, through this trust, pay for the private education of all the children and dependents of our, um, what is known as previously disadvantaged individuals in South Africa. So that means people of color under apartheid, they were disadvantaged. So in other words, anybody who works for us, um, whether it's their own children or, or children that they are in charge of, or extended family, we pay for their education from crash right through to university. And South African education system is one of the greatest tragedies of 
of the democratic era. It, it rates amongst the lowest in the, in, uh, in the United Nations tables, uh, always in the bottom three for sciences and maths. So it's, it's a real tragedy. Um, so we insist on them going to the highest quality schools, even if it's not in their comfort zone and getting the best education the country can pay for um, and money to pay for in the country, I meant. And this is all funded through Land of Hope and the Land of Hope wines, um, which we make, an, again, in exactly the same philosophy as we do Radford Dale. And um, in fact, the wine um, in, that we're sort of celebrating tonight from the wine champs is the Land of Hope Reserve Chenin Blanc, um, which Jo mentioned in her intro, introduction, which um, much to our amazement and gratitude did so well. Uh, fifth, one of 58 selections out of 1,100 wines, blind tasted, amazing. So this, uh, this trust has a huge amount of good and 50% of all the profits go directly to the trust with no monies taken away from it. The other 50% goes into funding the project and to funding the production. So we don't actually need to make any money from it as long as it washes its hands. My shareholders and I are uh, completely committed to this continuing forever. We currently have 14 children in private school in, in, through the trust, and that goes up and that goes down depending on obviously the age of the children. And we've had our first um, child going right through the system up to tertiary education. So it's, it's great to see it now working right through the, the school life of the, of, of the child. Here we go. This is what they look like. And our, our logo, or our slogan, I should say, is drink well, do good. So the most important thing about the wines is they're high quality. Um, it's not about charity. It's about the same as all of our wines. It's about high quality. You happen to be doing a good thing if you drink. There you go. Then in 2017, continuing the timeline, um, you know, there are over 800 wineries in South Africa and uh, our wine Bible, which is called the Platter Guide, every year, um, rates every single winery. So there are you know, 800 plus wineries in the guide annually. And one wine a year is rated as the red wine of the year. So we were the red wine producer of the year in 2017, which was a remarkable achievement, um, luck of the draw. And it was with our Black Rock, which is um, the wine that we pioneered in, in the Swathland area. Uh, so it was, it's been a multiple five-star award wine, but this time it was also red wine of the year. Um, and then the following year, 2018, following on the uh, timeline, uh, we celebrated our 20 years of existence. And there I am with my, uh, my partners in the business celebrating. And we created a wine list, doing vertical listings of wines over, over about 15 years, in fact. Inv invited uh, one of the top chefs in South Africa to cook for us lunch and dinner for three days. And then we invited to table of 10, the top restaurateurs, the top retailers, and the top journos in the country to thank them for supporting us for 20 years and just had a great time. And we did have a great three days, I must say. We rented this luxury villa in, as you can see, next to uh, um, the Kemp's Bay, uh, beautiful views, amazing time, great memories. So what's 2020 and beyond? Um, there's a series of small images here just to sort of explain what we're about and what we're planning and what we're doing. We've always been uh, highly attuned to sustainability um, all of our wines carry the, what's called the sustainable um, seal, which means that you have traceability back to the vineyard and all the treatments uh, in terms of uh, no pesticides and herbicides and, and also how we treat our staff and labor issues and whatever. It's all governed by this. Uh, but we believe in, in making wines naturally and you have to look after that nature as well as uh, your human capital. So sustainability is a a big driver. Everything we do is by hand. We don't do, we don't have any mechanical pickers. Um, we do everything on a small scale. It's incredibly labor intensive. And whether you're the most senior person in the business or the most junior, uh, you roll up your sleeves and you get involved and you pull your weight. Um, that press that you can see the, on the third one, the small scale is, is genuine. This isn't marketing. You can, the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you can see the actual size of the full press. And until this year, that's, that's the press we've used for all of our red wines uh, for Anfidel um, for 15 years. Uh, we now have a second one, which is slightly bigger than that, but it's the same process. Very small batch because we're making single vineyard wines predominantly. WITA is Wine Industry Ethical Trade Association. We're one of the early founding members of this organization in South Africa. So everything linked again to environment and ethics, um, very important to us. We make a lot of wines, or increasingly, uh, we're making wines that are grown from organic fruit. 
Um, in South Africa, you can't make organic wines in the same cellar as wines that are not organic. So all the organic wines we've ever made, we've never been able to certify because we also make wines which are non-organic. So now we've, we've opened a second cellar, which is purely for organic wines. And we also have some wines where we have zero additions, including zero sulfur. So we'll be putting together a new collection, which will be um, from the 2020 vintage going forward, specifically for those wines. Low additives, meaning very little usage of chemicals. Um, some wines absolutely zero, uh, very little new oak. And there's a new barrel there, but it's, we, we use, you know, maybe two or 3% of new oak you know, across everything we do. And we import our own barrels. So Chassin that you see there is the finest artisanal cooperage in Burgundy, and we are the importer for South Africa. Um, from 2020 onwards, 100% of our wines are vegan friendly. Most of them were, um, there were still a couple that weren't. So since 2020, everything is. Um, so it's just much easier that way. Everybody knows uh, for those who are interested in that type of thing. And then lastly, um, in this sort of uh, sphere of uh, matters is our social conscience and our desire to uplift our community and to invest in education and invest in the next generation. And that's the Land of Hope project. Um, our terroir selection are, is our broad range of our top wines. And most of these wines are single vineyard wines. That's why we have so many of them. And in fact, there's a few more since this picture was taken. And we'll, con excuse me, we'll continue to add to these for the simple reason that um, whenever we can combine the, um, the type of site that we're interested in, geologically speaking, climatically, with vineyards that are at the state of their maturation or age, to be able to produce the quality of fruit that we want, we will add another wine. Um, rather than try to make bigger quantities of a single wine or blend them together, um, we're much more interested in, in giving a voice to each of the vineyards. Um, obviously, where we do make a blend, then it can't be a single vineyard wine, but they're, they're, they're the same vineyard blocks that we work with year in, year out. And some of our wines now are really aging nicely. The, the bottle on the far left-hand side, which is actually what I've been drinking, is our Renaissance Chenin Blanc. Um, which was 50 years old this year. It's an old bush vine, Shannon, on the top of a mountain, and every single wine has its own story. I'm not going to go into all of them now, um, but I urge you to try them. Unfortunately, there are none left in stock at the moment. The Re Revelation Shannon sold out recently, Joe told me, but they do come into stock from time to time, and maybe you can twist Joe's arm. Um, these are my partners in, in the business that work in the business with me. And this is not a one-man show. I have a, a team of 20 people. And the five that you see in front of you are the owners that work in the business. Um, Heather Whitman has been with me since, since Longridge days. So she's been a founding partner in the business. To the far right-hand side there, Edouard Labbe, who's from France, who spends four months of the year with us. One of my old drinking buddies. Um, been in the business since day one. So three of us came from Longridge. And then the two newbies, Kathleen, who looks after all the money, uh, or lack of, uh, she's been with us for 12 years. It's good to have a woman in charge of the, of the money because she runs a very tight ship. And Jacques uh, started as Edward's assistant winemaker today. He's our director of viticulture and winemaking. We never differentiate between viticulture and winemaking responsibilities. We see them as the same. Um, so a lot of wineries have a farm manager and they have a winemaker. And we, we don't practice that because they're in, in France, there's no word for winemaker. It's viticulteur. So um, never should they be separated, in my opinion. And then I have three sleeping partners. Um, my mentors in the industry. Our chairman is a very good friend of mine called Andy Openshaw up in Joburg. Rob Hill-Smith, now he's very well known in the industry. He owns wineries in Australia. He's the oldest family-owned winery in Australia, which is Yolumba. And he's one of my oldest friends and supports us. He's a shareholder in the business. And my godfather from the UK, Cliff Roberson, who owns Roberson Wines in the UK including the, uh, the winery in um, uh, Earl's Court, a uh, real character. And these, it's, to have this sort of cumulative wisdom there as a sounding board is an amazing thing for, for a winery on the, on the other side of the planet trying to find its way through life. Um, and then this is our vintage team. Uh, I say we have 20 people. There's more than 20 because you've got a couple of, every year we have two or three stagiaires from different parts of the world, often from France. And those two enormous chaps on the far right hand side at the back, both two meters tall, one from Burgundy, one from Holland, that were our uh, helpers this year. And we, we send our team across to France often as well, Australia. Um, 
And there I am with my dog, Pino. So Pino is very important. Um, she's the only one that doesn't listen to me. And what an amazing crew we have, um, spanning all the different um, cultures of South Africa, which is, uh, which is amazing. Um, focus on the wine that was in stock, which is now out of stock, which can be back in stock in, let's say, a month's time. Um, we're loading it tomorrow. Uh, it will go into Cape Town Port tomorrow. So it will ship on the weekend and you'll have it in a few weeks' time. And uh, this is your wine champion. In fact, no, you weren't initially going to have the second bite at the apple, but um, uh, Joe was very proactive and asked me if you could have some more. So you've got another uh, chunk of it on the way, which is magnificent. And then lastly, amongst all these, uh, there's a lot of... Um, Snobism in the wine industry is a lot of pretense, but I always say never take yourself too seriously. And uh, my sisters call me Shrek, and so do some of my friends and customers. So there you go. Um, you're all going to get a copy of this, I believe, or access to it. So if, it, if you need anything, you can follow us on social media. You can contact us anytime and uh, we'll get back to you. But there you go. There's some background to us, who we are, what we do. And I believe, Anna, you're now going to subject me to a whole lot of questions. Well, yes, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you um, from all of us. What a fabulous presentation. And, and as Alex said, uh, we are indeed sending or able to send a copy of that presentation for anybody who would like to see it, particularly if you're on a smaller screen or you were enjoying writing notes and perhaps didn't get everything down. Uh, just let us know um, and we will certainly send you a PDF version of that. Um, just before we do move on, um, I think I would, if it's all right with you, Joe, I'd like to have a little bit of insight into how the wine tasted during Champs. So what made it a particularly good uh, wine champion? We've also had a couple of members give their thoughts on some tasting notes. Uh, so if you had a couple of brief tasting notes um, about the wine champion wine, that would be fantastic. And Alex, obviously, chip in as well. I'm here. I'd, I'd love to comment on the wine. I, um, I wasn't able to get a bottle either. So I'm not able to join you tasting the wine now, but I'm certainly looking forward to tasting it when it does come back into stock. Um, honestly, we, we, we never thought it would sell so well from the outset. So we're just, we're chuffed to bits that it's gone so well in the offer. Um, and actually in the tasting itself, as you know, of course, all the tasting is blind. So it was such a pleasure. I will be totally frank and say that there were numerous Shenans in, in the tasting, of course. Um, Shenan gets the rather un unglamorous day of miscellaneous whites. Um, so there's a real mixture of different styles within that day of the more kind of neutral grapes, um, if you like. But anyway, there's a good slug of Shenan. And there was a wine in there that for totally selfish reasons, I was really kind of hoping it it would come through but it wasn't that wine that I was kind of hoping would come through it was this one and I was absolutely chuffed to bits when it did because as I mentioned to you last week Alex when we chatted about your presentation I, I um, you had some pretty stiff competition in that in that day tasting day so it was just it was wonderful to see it and it was wonderful to see that it was this wine as well which is the first time we've bought it no it's not we've had it one Vintage before. before. Yeah, you before. We did have one vintage before. So it was it was just a joy, you know, and I think I think the wine express and it was quite new into the bottle at the time. I think I'm, pr I'm yeah. pretty sure that the wine wasn't even labeled. It, 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 I, I sent it to you after recently. Bottle. Yeah. Um, and it it just it expressed itself beautifully. I used in our quote in the offer, I used something that you guys had said to me, which was that it was your most ebullient of Chenets. Now that doesn't mean that it's in your face. It's not. It's not yeah. over the top. It's a very. It's a. It's a wine that's going to be very easy to drink with food or without. But yeah, I. I, I liked that description. Description and and I think it means that it's a very approachable wine as well. So yeah, you know, hats off. It was great. Really good to see. Can I just jump in there, Anna? Please. I'm allowed to. Yeah. Um. Yeah. We we make half a dozen different Shannons from all these individual vineyards, and. The, this is actually side by side. The Land of Hope Reserve Shannon is side by side with our with our top Shannon, the Renaissance. And they're both 50-year-old vines, they're, they're contingent blocks. Um, 
And when I call it the most ebullient, it, I guess it's got a little bit more viscosity. It's got a little bit more pallet weight because it's from more clay dominant soils underpinned by granite, but they, it gives it this textural side to it, which makes it a more approachable and more friendly. And mm -hmm. some of our other Shenans, which I, I, I noticed the comment coming up from somebody saying, uh, disappointed by our rating, by the rating in platter. Quite often our Shenans get, they always get good ratings, but they never get necessarily the, the best ratings. We tend to make wines with more restraint. And a lot of premium Shenans in South Africa traditionally have been bigger wines, you know, higher alcohol, some residual sugar, more new oak. And those are the ones that tended, tended to get the gongs until now. And we've always tried to make wines which are vineyard driven, site driven, mm -hmm. and have more restraint. And that's, you know, that perhaps explains it. But the, this, the land of oak reserve Shannon is always friendly and in a good mood. It makes you smile. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, it's lovely. We love a smiley wine. <laughs> I, well, I, hope we I saw there were some, some fascinating questions coming in, Anna. Absolutely, and we've had uh, um, lots of people as well comment saying that they are they are um, drinking that Shannon this evening. So those lucky people Good. got in there. Glad someone got it. <laughs> um, so I must. I have my first question is on behalf of a member named Tim, and um, he said that in his view, uh, the compact. Co oh, pardon me complex and food friendly Shenans might potentially do what South Africa at uh, for South Africa what Sauvignon Blanc uh, did for New Zealand do I think it's probably a question for both of you but Alex if, if we start with you do you think there's some merit in that well I think Sauvignon Blanc's a weed so I'm probably the wrong person to ask um, I, I ripped think out more in the sense of um, listen, I think your, your, I was going to say your reader, your member definitely has a, a very valid point in that Chenin Blanc is South Africa's opportunity to create um, a name for itself with one varietal, to own a varietal. Um, uh, we have more Chenin Blanc vineyards in South Africa than any other country in the world. In fact, more than all the other countries in the world combined. And in fact, we have more old vine Chenin Blanc in South Africa than there is Chenin Blanc in the Loire Valley in France. And in addition to that, in France, in the Loire, where Chenin originates, you're not allowed to put Chenin on the label. So really South Africa has this incredible opportunity to own the name Chenin and to really distinguish itself with it. But more importantly, is that Chenin loves our environment. It loves our soils and it loves our climate. And that's why it does so well. It chose us. So it, it, you know, if you want to work with nature and if you want to really play to your strengths in your region. And if you go through you know, any wine region in Europe over the millennia, it's been honed down to what grapes work in that region. Pinot Noir over hundreds of years, thousands of years, has, has, has been the sole red grape that grows in Burgundy, Chardonnay, you know, with tiny exceptions. And you could say that for each of the wine regions of Europe, they, they all have their own varieties. And South Africa's variety that works with our nature over hundreds of years, because we've been making wine here for over 360 years, the one grape that works in all over the Cape is Chenin Blanc. So yes. Uh, can I can I come in there because I think that that is that is so right, and it's a grape that is so versatile. So it can make your light, fruity, very simple, you know, sitting on the beach kind of wine, as well as some of the really serious examples, whether they are those heftier barrel fermented examples or whether they are the restrained examples that you guys produce. And I think it's it, it's so fascinating for that. There are so many different styles. So it, yeah, for sure, it's it's a signature. I mean, look at the good hope. These days, it, it it really kind of um, rises to that that reputation. I think. Joe, look, look at the good hope Shannon that you. I think you currently have in stock. Mm -hmm. Our Bushwein Shannon Blanc from Stellenbosch, um, yeah, which I believe you sell at about ten pounds, um, possibly a tiny bit less. But I mean, that's an incredibly good value. Chenin Blanc, um, but that's all stainless steel. There's no oak in that whatsoever. It's a little bit like the an oak Chardonnay, but it's from vines which are 40 old, 40 plus years old, on the lees for six months, low yielding, all hand picked, natural ferment. So you can still make very pretty, crisp, easy drinking wines from Chenin Blanc, as you say, versatility wines. And then you can go to the other end of the spectrum and make these, you know, very age worthy, complex wines as well, as you as you can in France, as you can in the Loire. It's, it's one grape, like Riesling, like Chardonnay. It's one white grape that can age for decades if it's made well. Or be drunk very young. <laughs> Both. 
good stuff. Um, we do have a question from Philip Green. I'm not sure whether we've been able to unmute you, Philip. So I will ask in your behalf if if you don't pop up immediately. I'm unmuted. There we go, Philip. Do feel free to ask your question to Alex. I thought your presentation was brilliant, actually. We, we know of you, but never heard you speak, obviously. Um, my, the, the number of my question is, we hear so much about the Svartland revolution. And some of the names up there are very high profile and, and also very expensive. Um, how do you, as, as a Shenin specialist, I mean, you're broader than that, but you're, Shenin is one of your specialities. How do you react to what's been going on in Svartland in the last 10 or 15 years? Um, well, we were one of the first people in the Swartland to make premium wines. Um, we've been producing wine there since 2003, so way before it became the trendy, renowned place it is today. So we, we, we actively partook in um, gaining recognition for the region. So um, our Black Rock, um, which was the red wine of the year, uh, is from there and it's, you know, it's been consistently well awarded so but we often don't get associated with it because we're not based in the Swartland. Um, I've always believed in the Swartland which is why I've invested so much time and money in pr producing the wines we do from there. Um, the Swartland is to me one of the great vineyards of South Africa for a certain style of wine for a certain type of wine. For me it reminds me a lot of the Southern Rhone and for those of you that have been to South Africa and you see how rugged it is um, and the heat that there is there, and, and you know these old gnarled bush vines, and there's there's a there's a rawness and there's a wildness that reminds me of the Southern Rhone. Um, the Shillings that are made in the Swartland are very very different to to Stellenbosch, um, uh, you know. But that's that's as you'd expect. But I I personally believe that the Swartland is one of the great regions. Um, it's not necessarily the best at everything by any standards. I mean. Try making Pinot Noir there, for example. It's not something you should try. Um, but the Swartland also is a very big region. So there are many places within the Swartland which are emerging with their own characteristics, particularly at, on, on mountains at, 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 you know, relatively at higher altitude where you've actually got very cool nights, some very complex wines coming from those areas rather than blockbuster wines. So, um, no, I'm a big fan of the Swartland, big, big fan, and always have been. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I hope that answered your question, Philip. Um, we have, I'm going to squeeze in two more questions and I hope you don't mind. Um, we do have a question from Pia. And again, Pia, I'm not certain you'll be able to be unmuted. You said you might have been having a microphone problem. Okay, I'm guessing she's not here. So Pia has... Oh, this, there we go. Hi, hey, Pia. Okay, it works. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. I absolutely love Redford Dale wines. I visited the vineyard several times. A special thanks to Tom and Abby, who I know quite well. You sound uh, Scandinavian. I am very Swedish, I, ah. but I live, I live partly in Cape Town. Okay, great. I, um, I wanted to know, in Sweden, no, uh, what's called natural wines are getting increasingly popular. Yeah. What are your views on that? Um, well, we make a lot of natural wines um, and have done, you know, for a very long time. Again, it's, it's a name which has become more widely used in, in recent years and perhaps abused. Um, you know, what is a natural wine? I don't think we've got time for that discussion now. But for, for me, any wine that's made um, from vineyard to bottle with vineyard practices and winemaking practices which um, are as far as possible without chemicals and pesticides and herbicides and additions and you know whatever that's natural wine the most famous natural wine in the world is Domenda Romney Conti um, but the notion of natural wine being wines which are very obscure and either orange or they're you know re-fermenting in the bottle or they're you know weird um, perhaps that's a slight distortion um, I happen to like a lot of different styles of wines, and I even like those quirky, sometimes a little bit out there, natural wines. I don't like faulty wines, and sometimes that can be an excuse, but I, again, I'm a big fan of, of natural wines. Um, it has been very popular in Scandinavia. I think Copenhagen was really where it latched onto first, but that spread across Scandinavia. 
UK has been very big with it, um, London in particular, but it's also elsewhere. Um, I think it's it's sort of the counter reaction to the era of parkerized wines, which were these manufactured, big, heavy, alcoholic extracted, non-natural wines. And people have just turned against that. Uh, it's boring. Rather like in the food sphere, people have turned away from mass produced wines and are more interested today in you know, local farms and organic product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the same applies to wine. And thank goodness we're going back to a, an era of authentic wines as opposed to manufactured wines. And I think that is great. And natural wines are an expression of that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, right, we're going to squeeze the last question in. <laughs> and in particular, Alex, you have really brought to life some of your foodie experiences this evening. I think the, the restaurant tour photos have made everyone jealous and probably slightly hungry if they haven't already eaten here in the UK. Um, in particular with the Wine Champion wine, um, do you have any food recommendations? Hopefully some people have held onto a couple of bottles and might be able to make some of your recommendations to go alongside the wine. What would you well, suggest? I'm, I'm not gonna give you a, I wasn't expecting the question, so I haven't thought about it, but you know, my immediate response is to pick up on what Joe said earlier, and that's the versatility of Chenin. And, and a Chenin, like the Reserve Chenin of Land of Hope, uh, is an incredibly versatile wine. So you'd be surprised. You can enjoy that with, you know, whether it's fish and, and certain types of, of, of seafood. I mean, for example, um, Coquille Saint-Jacques. Uh, how, how do you say that in English? What are they called in English? Um, uh, yeah, help me. <laughs> okay. Um, you know what I'm talking about. But Coquille Saint-Jacques with that Chenin, the texture of the two is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's crab, you know, so seafood type things and, and, and fish. Um, and then one of the things I love that wine with is right at the other end of the spectrum is at the end of a meal with hard cheese. So um, uh, hard cheese like Conte or Gruyere, those types of things. Even cheddar, actually, with a good Chenin Blanc is lovely. But, you know, in between, you know, you can reel off chicken and white meat and pork and things like that. And, go through all sorts of pasta dishes and salads and do all the, you know, try and cover all spectrums. But the thing about Shannon is it really does go with a lot of different foods. Well, hopefully for those members who have, maybe there are a couple of glasses down in their bottle, they might be able to root around in the fridge now and uh, find a nice comp day or a hard it's cheese to- Summertime, to summertime. Food. It's nice to sit outside after a, a meal when you've got a, a, a late um, daytime, which you do in the Northern Hemisphere, we, we don't here obviously. Sit down with a, you know, if you've got half a bottle of the Chenin left from the day before or, or whenever, sit outside, take a block of cheese with you or a couple of cheeses and sit outside, drink your, your Chenin with some cheese. It's absolutely glorious. <laughs> Perhaps heaven. not the answer you expected. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that sounds like absolute heaven. And um, Emma, our colleague who's on the call, is a huge fan of Chenin and, and cheese. So she'll yeah. be giving you a hypothetical thumbs up, I'm sure, from behind the screen. Well, again, um, if you if you consider where the Chenin comes from, from the Loire, that's, you know, great cheeses from the Loire. Um, you know, Sauvignon Blanc is often associated with, 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 with Loire cheeses, but Chenin Blanc too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I do apologise. We've hit our sort of eight o'clock time and we have actually had a few questions we haven't been able to answer. Alex did kindly suggest, uh, and Joe, that if there were some unanswered questions, we'd get back to you over email. Uh, so if you did ask a question and your name wasn't obvious, please do resend it via email. And if you did submit one over email, we will get back to you and hopefully answer some of those. Uh, the missed questions, we try and get through as many as we can, but um, unfortunately, not quite enough time this evening. No, I went over, didn't I? Sorry. Can I, no, <laughs> no, I, you did tell me not to. <laughs> I, th I think you I think you did a, a great job. I we, we, we chatted about the presentation last week and I've loved um watching it with everybody um and i i just wanted to pick out a couple of comments i i i think what you've you've shown us today a fascinating um perspective of the kind of negotiation model the european negotiation model that you've adapted for south africa and i love what you said when you talked about seeing the potential in south africa and realizing that potential whether it's in vineyards or, it, or in the people, and you've, you've backed the people just as much as you've backed the vineyards. And 
for that I have huge respect for you. And 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 I I have to say I I, I love the I love the Shrek picture. I love the fact that you that you put that up because that it sums you guys up. You know when 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 you visit, it's very hard to. Um, to, to capture what is it about a particular producer that, that gives you, and of course it's the wines, of course, you know, we're there for the wines, but actually there are people that you enjoy working with, you enjoy visiting, and there's, there's, a, there's a sense of fun, there's a sense of humor, um, all combined with a sense of respect. Um, and for that huge admiration, and South Africa is extremely lucky to have you, and thank you so much for giving us that, that kind of run through of, of where South Africa has come from and where it's going to, uh, which I think is just continues to be so exciting. So Alex, thank you so much for all your time and all of your work. And Abby too, because I know she's been working seriously hard behind the scenes. Of course she has. She's, and she does it seamlessly <laughs> so, so that you know she's there. Um, if I can respond to what you just said, you know, obviously it's a great pleasure. And, uh, we really enjoy working with the Wine Society. It's one of my favorite customers in the world. And the values of the Wine Society just dovetail so beautifully with you know, our own values. Um, you, I just want to pick up on one of the words you use, negotiants. Negotiant is not a bad, it's not a bad word. And, and it tends to be banded about as if it's something inferior. You know, if it's done properly, it's, a, it's brilliant. Um, we don't own a single vineyard and we don't own a single brick but we work with the same parcels of land year in, year out for 20 years. You know, we co-manage the vineyards. We pick the vineyards, as, you know, we make the wine from A to Z, but, um, but this model allows us to explore in, I only have one lifetime. So in my one career in South Africa, I can explore this, all these areas which haven't been taken seriously before and be part of the generation that really puts it on the map. So I couldn't do that with an estate model. Um, why would I move to South Africa to do that? You know. I could have stayed in France. Um, um, so that, that, that for me is, is, is the essential part of what we've tried to do. And, you know, that's been the first, if you like, the first 25 years of Ramsden Down. Um, and, and, then, and then lastly, I think um, in terms of having fun, my goodness me, why would you do this if you weren't out to have fun? Um, <laughs> it's far too I, hard work. <laughs> I'm a bit of a technophobe, but when we first registered our, our, our web site account, um, I call it the funwinery.com. And um, of course, then that linked into our email addresses. So people were getting, so people didn't refer to us as Raffadell, they called us the fun winery. And I thought, oh dear, that's gone a bit far. So, you know, we undid that and called ourselves Raffadell.com instead. But um, yeah, it's really important to have fun. And, you know, one of the reasons why I import wines from Burgundy and, you know, I, I do that on top of producing our own wines is because I love what I do and my team loves what they do. And that's why we, we, we stick together and enjoy it so much. And um, we're never gonna get rich doing this, but we're, we're gonna spend our lives doing something really worthwhile. And um, every day is fulfilling and every day is a challenge. Um, you work with nature. It's very difficult, you know, with all the thousands and thousands of wineries there are in the world to find a route to market. Um, but it's worth it, it's very gratifying. And you, know, you get to drink great wine. Uh, and get paid for it so who, who, you know absolutely <laughs> <Be> that <laughs> well cheers to you guys all right thank you and thank you everyone for joining cheers thank you alex right. cheers anna thanks thank guys all. bye <laughs>